whole uh, astronomy uh, field. He's a uh, planetary. First, he's with Hanson Planetarium, which switched over to Clark Planetarium. He has a 40-year background there, and fortunately for him, but unfortunately for the public, he retired. So. No, no. Fortunately for the public. So, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Scott. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I started working for Hanson Planetarium as an usher in the fall of 1978. Um, and uh, it was, you know, even though it was a job, I remember that I had a better paying job that paid $250 an hour and Hanson Planetarium paid $225 an hour. Oh. And I could just tell that the planetarium was so much cooler. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, yeah, I really like this place. And so one thing led to another. And I being an usher to a cashier to a science demonstrator. I will, I will admit a crime. When I was a cashier, uh, because I was the least senior of the cashiering staff, I got assigned to work Sundays, because that's when you know, the low person uh, is assigned. And that meant that I was alone in what we would call the bookstore, which was basically racks and racks of books with wonderful books by Carl Sagan and a bunch of other uh, popular astronomers, uh, William Alvin and some others. And I cheated. What I did is I would take a book out of the rack and open it just enough that I could read the pages but not break the back of the binding so that it looked open. And I confess that most of my astronomy education mm -hmm. All of the astronomy education that has been useful to me in my career came from stealing a book from the bookstore at Hanson Planetarium, reading it without breaking the spine of the book, and then putting it back on the shelf. Um, and it was that way. It was that way that I read most of the Carl Sagan books. Uh, and then, like I say, I think there was a book by Jastrow and Kaufman and Camp Cole and others. But anyway, that was my. That was my first education in astronomy. A long time ago. Yeah, so let's get started. Thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about, um, it occurs to me that what we really want to do is something that is uh, timely, um, and that has to do with the fate of the national park system as it relates to the protection of the night sky. Um, and this also is something uh, Joe suggested that I speak somehow to my history uh, with the planetarium. And this does relate to one of my earliest activities uh, shortly after I became a member of a full-time staff and I was a brand spanking new science education specialist. So today, Halley's Comet is clear heck and gone past the orbit of Neptune. It's like roughly the distance to Pluto um, away from the sun, but in the spring of 1986, Halley was making one of its every 76 year orbits of the sun, and in early 1986, its proximity to Earth was such that you could go outside and have a chance to see this historical, historically significant comet. The trick was that it was kind of below the, uh, or the plane of the solar system, which meant that um, you really needed a southern latitude to get it your best, and that for those of us in the northern hemisphere, your best viewing was going to be accomplished by going south. So figuring that the thing to do where there was a place with famously clear skies, high altitude, and fairly southern latitude, I decided that I was going to go to Bryce Canyon. <laughs> And uh, so my wife and I, uh, we drove to Bryce, and I was feeling pretty grim about it because we drove down in the middle of a snowstorm, and Bryce Canyon in March is in the middle of winter, and it's miserably cold, and it was snowing like crazy. And we went to bed with the sky completely leaden and snow falling, and we thought, oh, well, you know what, at least we have to drive. We'll get pancakes in the morning and then we'll drive back to Salt Lake City. Set the alarm clock for 3.30 in the morning, woke up at 3.30, showered, dressed, went outside, and it snowed heavily all night, and now the sky is crystal clear. 
there was a foot of fresh fallen powdery snow. Uh, the kind of snow that when you walk through it, it just kicks up billowing clouds of something that resembles chalk dust. And uh, we drove, now there was no Google Maps in 1986, but we drove the 19.4 uh, miles, and I'm here to tell you we did not take 33 minutes. Yeah. It took more like an hour and 33 minutes in this conga line of vehicles with billowing clouds of snow whirling around you. But we made it up to 9,000 feet to Yovimba Point, which is down at the bottom. That's the southernmost extreme of Bryce Canyon. 9,000 feet elevation. The temperature was 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty chilly. But we broke out the telescopes and found, and by the way, nobody was doing digital photography. This was film. There was Halley hanging low in the south. But what was interesting was one, that's about the best picture anybody got of it that morning. And if you see other photographs of comets, you say, what the hell's wrong with this? But that was about as good as Comet Halley was. But it was, I mean, it was an historically important comet to say, I saw Halley. Um, but what was really interesting was that the sky glow of the lights of Page, Arizona, were intruding into the image. And that was something none of us there were prepared for. Uh, remember 1986, that Page, Arizona, teeny little bird, like 30 or 40 miles away, was mucking up the, the lights of the sky. So it was after that event uh, that the then um, superintendent of Bryce uh, National Park, her name was Sandra Key, uh, she started talking to me about the fact that the skies at Bryce Canyon are sometimes light polluted and just polluted during the daytime with air pollution. And here is a kind of like bad day on the uh, Bad day on the on the on, on this side, clear air there. That's Navajo Mountain, as seen from Yovimpa Point. Uh, and it's a problem down there. Um, and that Grand Canyon was having a real issue because frequently the air at Grand Canyon, where people are supposed to have these breathtaking views, is often grayed out by. Guess where that pollution is coming from? Active member. Los Angeles. The smog of Southern California intrudes into the Grand Canyon, and with increasing frequency, that's what the air in the Grand Canyon looks like these days. So uh, I worked with Superintendent Key, and we wrote letters to Congress starting to talk about protecting national parks for their night sky and daytime air visibility issues. And uh, I like to think that I was sort of in on the ground floor back in 1986 and getting the national park system to pay attention to the fact that the sky above the park is as integral to the experience of the park as anything that is on the ground, any, any flora or fauna there. Uh, the issue of night sky pollution um, is manifest in these photographs. This is just a random photo uh, of uh, Southern California, and you can see that an enormous amount of light is uh, throwing up into the air, and the idea that you're going to do any kind of amateur astronomy in this environment is, of course, ludicrous. Uh, people have been able to map the light pollution of the United States, uh, first by kind of a painstaking series of aerial photographs, and then later with the advent of satellites. But here's a comparison of just, you know, less than 40 years, uh, the the sky glow in the U.S., and for those of you who want to know it, there's the Salt Lake Ogden and Provo metro area, Salt Lake Ogden and Provo. There's I-15, there's I-80, and so forth. As recently as 2012, the most recent photograph of this that I was able to find, you see that um, pretty much nobody in the eastern half of the country has anything that would allow them to see a truly dark sky. The, the Milky Way, which I remember seeing from my front yard in Salt Lake City, you know, that was just something that growing up in Salt Lake City in the 60s, I took for granted that you could go outside on a summer night and see the Milky Way. These days, um, something like two thirds of the nation's population cannot see the Milky Way when they go outside. 80%? Okay, I can believe that. Um, but I call your attention to this 
little hole in the light pollution. Now there's Salt, there's uh, Ogden, Salt Lake, Provo, Nephi, um, and lo and behold, there's Page, Arizona. You know, that's St. George, Cedar City, there's Page. But this little pocket of dark sky turns out to be kind of special. It's right here. This is where the Mighty Five National Parks are. Bryce Canyon, Zion. Arches, Canyonlands, Capitol Reef, you know, five world famous national parks <laughs> conveniently located to both Las Vegas and Salt Lake City. And one of the last really dark areas on the planet. And there, of course, is the light, the, the, the air from Page, Arizona. People up here in Arches uh, have to deal with light from Moab and uh, Grand Junction. That little pocket is pretty important, and so there's an organization. And have you ever had um, anyone from uh, Colorado Plateau? Yeah, Night Sky. Okay, oh, good. well, from what was the name of the group? Oh. The the Dark Sky Cooperative. Yeah. Well, the point is, this is a very special hole in the light polluted world, um, and within this pocket of dark sky, you not only have the mighty five national parks, but just an almost countless number of state parks and national monuments and state monuments, places that are becoming aware of how valuable the night sky is to their overall success as a venue. Uh, this leads us to a recent phenomenon known as astrotourism. And that is simply the people who make it a point to visit a national park where their primary reason for going is the clarity of the night sky. And I know, uh, Paul, you know, you and I have been a couple of times to the uh, Bryce Astor Festival. That's one of the biggest out there. Other national parks are just barely getting started. Uh, during my last years at Clark Planetarium, I participated in training programs to teach park rangers to do night sky programming. And um, what's really cool is that the park rangers uh, now in both... Um, Arches and Canyonlands and also Dead Horse Point State Park, they now have official park staff telescopes. And so they needed someone to teach them how to drive their new, you know, 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrains and various other things. And that was a lot of fun to work to train park rangers to use telescopes. Astrotourism turns out to be very significant. And an argument that can be made to the local county commissioners in terms of please protect the night sky is that astrotourism is the fastest growing reason cited for people visiting Western National Parks. It's not the number one reason. The number one reason is they want to see beautiful scenery. But the fastest growing reason reported when you ask people why they're visiting the parks is they're there for the night sky that they know they can't see anywhere else. Night sky programming in national parks has an economic impact. It creates $2 in park revenue for every one dollar that the park spends on night sky programming. More important to the county commissioners is that astrotourists generate three times more local economic activity than day visitors. Now why do you think that would be? <laughs> because they spend the night there. They, they sleep in motels. They generally spend more than one night in motels. That's more typical. And they eat in restaurants. They don't have a sack lunch with a bologna sandwich that they eat in the park and then drive home at the end of the day. They spend the night and they eat restaurant food and they're there for a couple of days. And so astrotourists are fabulous for the local economy. And that is why the county commissioners are sympathetic when you tell them that you want to protect the night sky around the national parks. And then the cool thing is, as the parks themselves embrace dark sky preservation and night sky in interpretation programs, they learn to be smarter with their lights, and the skies get darker, and the astrotourists become more vocal advocates, and they're more likely to say to friends and representatives, I love going to Bryce Canyon. Don't you dare let the skies get bright or polluted you know, don't build that cement plant on the outskirts of Capitol Reef, which I think they're still going to try and do. 
Um, light pollution is something that the parks have become tuned into. One of the things that we're up against is that the advent of LED lighting means that a lot of people think that because LEDs are so cheap, that woohoo, we're saving money and we can light everything up and everybody feels safe. And of course, quite the opposite is true. Uh, while you are saving money, you are over illuminating the areas and you are actually less safe in an over illuminated area. And so I, I simply use this as an example that at uh, Big Bend uh, National Park down in Texas, uh, they got smart about their night sky lighting. They save a ferocious amount of money now, and it is a safer park in terms of recorded accidents, incidents, whatever it is. And now, Big Bend National Park is a major astro-tourist destination. Astronomy there is a big, big activity. <coughs> so, the National Park System just celebrated its 100th anniversary. Happy birthday to you, National Parks. Um, National Park System uh, now starts thinking in terms of where does the next 100 years take us, uh, which leads me, and uh, I got to know these folks, I mean, my favorite human beings on the planet are number one librarians and number two national park rangers. Uh, and they have a lot in common. And what do uh, we amateur astronomers have with the national parks folks? So, you know, what are the things that bind us together? The obvious answer is we're both tremendous nerds. <laughs> and we enjoy, I mean, we are sort of flamboyantly nerdy. We really love it. But what it really boils down to is we love explaining things. We are there to interpret, share knowledge, and tell stories. And so what I want to do in this lecture tonight is talk about telling stories in a national parks environment that will work for you and work for the person that just happens to be in the parking lot with you in a national park. Okay, so let's say that you are the junior high school vice principal in Topeka, Kansas, and you're looking for someone to explain the natural world to you, and the explanations are kind of dull. The world is flat. You grow things on it. You harvest things on it. Sometimes it rains. So. The, the need to tell stories to explain, for most Americans, is kind of like this picture. It's kind of flat. We, however, living out west, we know that there is a lot of explaining that needs to be done. There are things going on that we almost take for granted, and shame on us if we ever do, where you say, do you know how many stories are to be told just in that location with just that view. It's staggering. Let's talk about the first stories, because you're in the West, it's only appropriate that you tell the stories of the indigenous people. Now, um, this is a story uh, told uh, by the Paiute, and it is of uh, the sky god Shino and his son Naga. Naga was a mountain sheep who was skilled at climbing mountains. There was not a slope that Naga could not get to the top of. He took ferocious pride in being able to climb every mountain. And he wanted to impress his father, Shino, by saying, look, Dad, at what I have accomplished. Well, one day, Naga saw a mountain so tall that it went through the clouds and disappeared. And he said, that's the, that's the mountain for me. So he began to climb. And he found a trail, and he went up and up and up, and next thing he knows, he's in the clouds, and then he's out of the clouds, but the mountain is still going up, and now the clouds are down below him. And then there's a little hole in the side of the mountain. He can't go any higher. The trail has disappeared, but there's like an opening. that The trail continues to go upward. It's very, very steep, however, and soon he finds that as he is clawing his way up this little tunnel-like trail on the inside of the mountain, he is kicking rocks and debris behind him and closing the path behind him. There is no way back. And after a very long time climbing, he finally comes to the summit. He, or rather, he tops the mountain and finds that he has emerged from the interior of the mountain, and now he is at the summit of the mountain on a little teeny piece of ground 
so small he can barely stand up. If he takes a step in any direction, he'll fall off. And he cannot go down anymore because the tunnel has collapsed behind him <laughs> from the debris of his climbing. And he shouts, Father, I am stuck. I can't get down. And Shino says, My son, I am so sorry, but there is nothing I can do to save you. I cannot bring you home. But here's what I will do. I will have the sky people, that's you, and I am the god of the sky people. And the sky people will honor you by dancing around you every night. And that is the reason why the North Star stands still and why all the stars travel in a circle around it. The sky people are honoring Naga for his climbing skills. Another great story. Why the constellations are imperfect. This is a Navajo story. Soon after the world was created, the great spirit said to all of the animals, congratulations, you've been made, and now this is your world, and I have also made for you the sky, and because I want the world to know that you are important and that I made you and that you matter, each one of you animals, go down to the river and gather the small bright pebbles. Bring them here, every one of you. So they all go down to the river, and they scoop up the little bright pebbles, and they bring them back up to the Great Spirit, and Great Spirit says, okay, here's the way this is going to work. Each of you are going to take turns, one after the other, and you are going to take your pebbles and put a picture of yourself in the sky so that, so that forever the world will know that you are here at the creation. And so... The scorpion gets the pebbles and makes a picture of the scorpion in the sky. And then it is the crow's turn and puts the pebbles. And then the eagle's turn. And then the bear's turn. And so forth. Including the man and the bear. Okay, the little bear, the big bear and the little bear. Anybody know the reputation of Coyote in Native American sky lore. He is trouble. He is the mischief maker. He is the equivalent of Loki in Norse gods. He is the agent of chaos. He's what ma he makes trouble. Well, Coyote is back of the line, end of the line, watching these animals so carefully building their pictures in the sky. And it's taking so doggone long and he's going like, can we please get on with it? No, wait your turn. Well, Coyote, waiting his turn is not something that Coyote does. So Coyote barges to the front of the line. Way, I mean, there's, there's every other creature is waiting their turn. But nope, only a dozen or so animals have put their things in the sky. But Coyote is impatient. So he barges up to the front of the line, grabs the blanket on which all the pebbles are, and flings them up into the sky. And now the pebbles are random willy-nilly all over the sky. And that's the reason why some star patterns make sense, but mostly they don't. And Great Spirit said to Coyote, you guts, look at what you did. To punish you, there will never be a constellation for Coyote. <laughs> Your punishment is that you don't get a constellation. And that is why Coyote, filled with remorse and shame, regret, howls at the moon for the missed opportunity of blowing it. Now I have to tell you one other thing. This is a Navajo story. And when you tell Navajo stories, I made the mistake of telling this story to a group of people <coughs> at Arches National Park, and a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, I am a Navajo elder. And I looked at him and said, you're kidding. <laughs> you look like a cowboy out of a bar, but okay. He said, you don't tell these stories except in the wintertime. 
<laughs> that is that that is the custom. Is that these are, these these are only in the winter time. These are stories that you tell in the winter time, which which is an ethical quandary. Now I'm safe with you folks here tonight because it's winter, um, but at the time because I was doing this in like August in in Moab, and the only thing I could think of is what like well, you have a choice. First of all, I'm I. I among you and your people, you can respect that tradition, and that's great. But I am not a Navajo. I am an astronomy educator. And I think that it is important that these stories be preserved by being shared. And I think the value of sharing the story is at least as great as preserving whatever sensibility you have about that story. And whether or not my position is correct is subject to debate but i cannot change the fact that i have already told the story and i think it's a really great story and it makes a lot of people appreciate and be more curious about native american sky lore and oh by the way there is not one monolithic body of sky lore every tribe has their own mythologies around these so i i hope i wasn't being a big jerk to this guy but I thought, you know, okay, I get it. But the, as Dave mentioned, these are stories that are supposed to be told in the wintertime. I will leave it up to you as to whether or not that is a degree of deference to them that exceeds the value of sharing this information. I mean, that would be like being in school and being told that you cannot study geology except in May. You know, or like in, in months that do not contain an R. I've had two young Navajos, teenagers, yeah. Tell me that the reason you don't talk about coyote in the summertime is because it's bad luck. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Well, yeah, and if you think that telling? bad it luck is something to be afraid of, be afraid of in the year 2020, <laughs> knock yourself out. So let's talk about telling stories. A good story explains something. And the stories that I told you about why the North Star stands still and why the constellations don't always make sense. Those stories explain the phenomena. They are shareable. I just shared them with you, and they're easy for you to go now and share with other people. They are satisfying. They're fun. You tell the story, and when you get to the punchline, people go, oh, that was nice. I, I kind of like that story. But now here we all come banging into the world with our Enlightenment era, and now, sons of guns, we ask ourselves about another dimension of storytelling, and that is, is it true? When you look to see if a story is true, well, that just really gums up the works. There are stories that are true <laughs> that they explain, and if you have the prerequisite undergraduate degrees, they may be satisfying, and if you, the listener, have the prerequisite degrees, they may be shareable. But not all stories are, the, you know, this, the, if you're going to explain the universe and tell the true story, the universe does not care whether or not it is satisfying and shareable. What matters is, are you telling the story right? So as amateur astronomers, we look for stories that we can tell that do not require this, because the people that we run into in the parking lots at Capitol Reef National Monument, a National Park, are not interested in this. They're on vacation. They want to relax. So a couple of stories that you can tell when you run into people at a campground. This October, when you look to the south, you're going to see some pretty cool stuff high in the southeast, shining at magnitude minus two. That's really bright. Uh, is going to be Mars. And then over in the southwest, really right next to each other are going to be Saturn and Jupiter, and kind of in between is this bright, lovely star, Fomalhaut, in the constellation of the southern fish. And you're going to be standing there in the parking lot and saying, you see that? That's Mars. And over there, that's Jupiter and Saturn. But that thing straight ahead down south, that's um, Fomalhaut. And oh, by the way, over here, that's Sagittarius, and there's the Milky Way, and there's the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And people are going to look at you like, so? Why is this interesting? And you go, well, let me tell you about the distances involved. 
Mars is only 0.4 astronomical units away, but Jupiter is 5 AU, and Saturn is almost 10 AU, but that's nothing. Fomalhaut is 25 light years away. And they look at you and go, what? That does not mean a damn thing to me. Just because those numbers don't relate in any way. And so you go, okay. You whip out your pocket calculator. And say, Let me put it to you this way. The distance is 39 million miles to Mars, 468 million miles to Jupiter, nearly a billion miles to Saturn, but 147 trillion miles to Fomalhaut. And the person that you're talking to says, and? None of those, do, do any of those numbers mean any? You can see that some numbers are bigger than others, but do you have any kind of gut level feel? No. no, of course not. So then you say, here's a fun fact. There are almost exactly the same number of inches in a mile, 63,360, as there are astronomical units in one light year. 63,241. Now, in the world of astronomy, those two numbers are identical. The difference between those two numbers is not worth debating. If you're talking astronomy, that's what matters, is that there are almost exactly the same number. Well, let's not even say almost. There are exactly the same number of inches in a mile as there are astronomical units in a light year, which means that if you shrink the universe down such that light years are now expressed in miles, then astronomical units are expressed in inches. And now back to our example. Mars, 0.4 AU, Saturn, 9.9, .9, Jupiter, 5, but Fomalhaut, 25 light years. Now, we just shrunk everything down. <coughs> Mars is now 0.4 inches in front of your nose less than half an inch in front of your nose. Jupiter is five inches in front of your nose. You can put your thumb on the tip of your nose and stick your pinky out, and that's where Jupiter is. And Saturn is about 10 inches in front of your nose. And yet Fomalhaut is in Lehigh. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, by the way, the other stars that you see around here, the average distance of these stars is going to be measured in the hundreds of miles and the Milky Way center, which is just right about off here, kind of here's the, the, the teapot of Sagittarius, and downtown Milky Way is right about there. And that's 25,000 miles, which you've blown your distance anyway. But the point you're saying is, if you shrink the universe down because of the similarity of astronomical units and inches and miles and light years, Mars is less than a half an inch in front of your face, Jupiter and Saturn are a hand span in front of your face, or just slightly in front of you. But the stars are measured in many, many miles. Even the closest star, Alpha Centauri, that's four miles. And what's in between? What's in between? Now you know why it's called space. <laughs> it's called space. So that is a story you can tell, and I tell you this because it's going to be night, and there's going to be people wandering around the parking lot trying to figure out where the restrooms are, looking for something, and, you get, and you're, you're standing around the telescope, and you've got to tell people things. You've got to keep them interested, and there's the stars all overhead, and you've got this cool green laser pointer, and you want to sort of share things, and so you can talk about, let me tell you the story about inches and miles and astronomical units and light years. Now... The sun is setting, and let's say that you're at uh, Capitol Reef, and you are bathed in this incredible red light from the setting sun and the natural palette of the desert southwest. And then you say to the people that you meet in the parking lot at the canyon overlook at Canyonlands, you want to hear a really cool story about the color of red? <laughs> and if you're lucky, people will go, okay. Because when you're in a national park, your brain is sort of predisposed to listen to something interesting. Your, your senses are already overwhelmed with a lot of, like, wow, this is a really cool place. Like, yeah, I'm kind of in the mood to let some new ideas in. I'm kind of having my mind blown, you know, every turn, every place we park the car, I see something in front of So you say, go ahead, tell me the story of red. So you go, now, this 
doesn't happen all the time, but in the summer months, this is the scorpion, Scorpius, and there, of course, is the teapot of Sagittarius in the Milky Way. But up here, kind of in the middle of the scorpion, is a star called Antares. And occasionally, sharing the sky with Antares will be Mars. And Antares is um, a word that means anti-Aries, or rival of Mars. Mm -hmm. And the rival of Mars things, when those two things are in the sky at the same time, you say to yourself, wow, you know, like brothers from the same mother, uh, they, they both shine red, but you go, look, Antares is a little bit different. Um, let's talk about Antares as a star. It is what's known as a red supergiant. It is so big that if you put it in our solar system, it would fill the solar system up out to about the orbit of Mars or beyond. It's really a big star. It shines red because it's in the process of dying. And dying supergiant stars have a really interesting internal structure you don't have to show these slides. You can just be standing in the parking lot, waving your hands around and talking, and say, old stars, as they get ready to die, are layered like an onion. Each layer is a different level of fusion in a process known as stellar evolution. Really, really old stars have each layer of fusion producing successively heavier and heavier elements and I'm oversimplifying, but trust me, for a parking lot conversation at Capitol Reef, this is just fine. By the time you get to the core of these giant dying stars, the innermost core is just iron. And iron is the death element for a star because it takes more energy to attempt to fuse iron than you release. All these other levels of fusion are producing energy. The magic word is exothermic. But fusion of iron is endothermic. It eats energy, which means that when a star has an iron core, it rapidly goes through a series of, ins of, of collapses. Things fall in on top of themselves. All that gravity is there, but there's no longer the outward push of fusion. The star falls in on itself, and then it blows up and forms a supernova. And if the supernova is nearby, say within a couple of thousand light years, we can point our telescopes at it and find this explosion de debris pattern, which if you also point your uh, spectroscopy instruments at it, you find is full of all kinds of interesting elements. Supernova occurring in other galaxies, uh, like this one and the uh, Whirlpool galaxy of just a few years ago, uh, the the, the supernova can be as bright as the galaxy itself. And, uh, and I remember looking at that through my telescope and thinking, wow, what a journey those photons have had to travel so far to terminate that flight in my retina. That's a kind of a cool thought. So supernova are pretty special things. But what's being made in these supernova? Well, when the universe started with the Big Bang, the atomic elements that were present at the creation of the universe, roughly just shy of 14 billion years ago, were hydrogen, helium, a little teeny bit of lithium, and a little teeny bit of beryllium. And that was just sort of like what the universe began with. But as the hydrogen fell on in itself, and normal stellar life cycles began to happen, small stars started doing fusion and they started creating boron and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and some neon and then larger stars which by the way live faster and die sooner uh, they start producing all of these other fascinating chemicals you know scandium magnesium yttrium uh, copper zinc uh, sulfur chlorine so forth really big stars supernova when they explode, that violent, violent explosion that literally takes a couple of minutes to tear the star apart. It's creating aluminum and silicon and lead and um, iridium and uh, rhenium and you know all of these things, radon, or rhenium rather. Um, and did they, they just persist in the universe after the they, they scatter, think of them as interstellar fertilizer drifting through space. And then exotic things. I mean, now this is where things get really interesting. 
you know, I used to like to say that, you know, the, the iron in your blood, the calcium in your bones, the oxygen in your lungs, those are all elements that became those elements as a star died. And the reason that gold is rare is that stars make gold only very briefly. Whereas the reason carbon and oxygen and aluminum are abundant is that stars make them for a relatively long period of time in the lifespan of the star. But more recently what we've discovered is that some really things like uh, gold here and things like thorium and uranium, they literally require the collision of two neutron stars to create. So in terms of the rarest of exotic phenomena, the gold in your teeth is not only evidence of how briefly stars make heavy materials as they die. Gold is evidence that neutron stars have collided. Because that's the only place you get energetic enough neutrons to create gold nuclei. Dave, you're bursting to say oh, something. Well, <laughs> I, one of the most interesting phenomena about this is that it, the, the presence of gold in merging neutron stars or from merge, merging neutron stars the amount of gold measured in interstellar and stellar space precisely matches the rate of neutron star mergers yes. measured thus far. Yeah, it's, a, so it's, it's actually it's, a proof of stellar evolution process. It's very, very accurate. Wow. Yeah. So, guess, and of yeah. course, we are familiar, those of you who did not sleep through high school, um, <laughs> you are familiar with, the, oh, and these are the man-made elements. Uranium. Yeah. But, of course, we simply know this is the periodic table of the elements. Now, you can actually, you don't need these slides, but what you're saying to the people in the parking lot at the Overlook at Canyonlands, as you're looking at Antares in the night sky, is you're saying, in that little red dot, a massive, massive star that would dwarf our sun is churning away in its death throes manufacturing the elements that you and I know as the ingredients in the periodic table of the elements. And therefore, the oxygen in our blood, the calcium in our bones, and through some pretty exotic phenomenon, the gold in our teeth are the result of stars dying. So that's when I like to say, if I've got the right kind of audience, you are more intimately connected to the universe than any story that any astrologer is ever going to tell you. I, have, I am telling you a story of origins and connection and connecting the dots to the life cycles of stars. You are quite literally a way for stars to be aware of themselves. That's a good story to tell at a parking lot in Capitol <laughs> Reef. All right, now we're looking at Antares. And Terry's is not red because that is the color of iron. It's red because that's the color that a star gets when it blows up really, really huge while it's making iron furiously in the core. But on a night when you're looking at not anti-Aries, but Aries itself, Mars, you look at the color red and you go, oh man, we have seen that color before. That color is familiar to me. That is the color, the surface of Mars, that's Mars, that is the color of the American Southwest. <laughs> What's going on with that wonderful, ruddy, ochre-like color? Well, it has to do with the fact that iron is abundant, and iron combines with oxygen, also a product of stellar evolution, and that oxides of iron have a characteristic color Sometimes we call it rust, sometimes we call it a national park. <laughs> Your blood is red because hemoglobin is a mixture of iron and oxygen. A person can be iron deficient, in which case you are anemic. Iron is essential to your blood. Your blood is red because stars have died. You are connected to the color red through the, through the life cycles of stars. Why are barns red? Because farmers are, if there are farmers in the room, I will say, you're frugal. If there are no farmers in the room, I say, 
Farmers are cheap. <laughs> a barn is an enormous building with a lot of surface area of rough-hewn wood. You ever try to paint rough-hewn wood? It soaks the paint up like a sponge, and it takes an insane amount of paint to get a coat on that. So if you are a frugal or cheap, depending on your perspective, farmer, and you have to buy a lot of paint, what color paint are you going to buy? The least expensive paint there is. The thing that gives paint color is a pigment. And what is the least expensive pigment you have to color paint? Red oxide. Why? Because it is abundant. It's in the dirt. You can get it anywhere. Barns are red because stars made a lot of iron as they <coughs> Sometimes the little red schoolhouse. Why are schoolhouses red? Same reason. The, the city elders said, okay, we got I guess we gotta build us a schoolhouse, but for crying out loud, paint it cheaply. And red paint is the least expensive. My wife is an artist, and so she's always going to the store and buying tubes of oil paints. Susie, what's the least expensive paint? Red, of course. <laughs> if you are a wealthy farmer. You want to show off to your neighbors and really strut your stuff, you paint your barn white. Yeah. That's the second cheapest paint. Uh, but normal farmers paint their paint. National parks, America's great idea, great best idea. 100 years old now, like 102 years old. Uh, there's the original father. So the question that I have now, sort of in closing, is where do we go from here? What does the future hold? for the national parks, and why would amateur astronomers be curious about the future? Well, I call your attention to the uh, act of Congress that created the national parks. The National Park Service shall, and follow along here, conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects, leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. Pay attention to historical objects. Now, the National Park System has park rangers who guide historic sites, landmarks, objects. Think the Liberty, Bear, Liberty Bell, think uh, Gettysburg, you know, uh, any number of historically significant objects and sites. And now I say, 100 years into the future, Will the National Park Service still exist? God, I hope so. A hundred years in the future, what are the historical objects that we will be interested in preserving? Is that an historical object? Yeah. Yes. Does it deserve to be protected and preserved for the enjoyment and edification of future generations? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is that an historical object? That is the descent and landing stage of an Apollo spacecraft. There are six of these on the moon right now. They are historical objects along with every tire print and footprint around them. There are three of these on the moon. Historical object, deserving of protection and preservation. What organization is probably best equipped in terms of its mission to do that? Right. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up someplace else. <laughs> and I use that as a caution because there are examples of historically significant objects that because they were not recognized as being historically significant, what happens to them? Case in point, Bonnie and Clyde's car where they were blown up by marshals. Bonnie and Clyde's car is in the lobby of a casino. <laughs> And it's not even in Las Vegas, it's someplace else. So here you have what is arguably a, an historical object. I mean, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, they're part of American folklore, culture, literature. But instead, you've got these cheesy mannequins, and it's in the casino next to the food court. That's oh. what happens yeah. if you don't pay attention. Conserve the scenery and natural and historic objects for the unimpaired enjoyment of future generations. So what would you call that?
That's oh. Mount Sharp on Mars, where the Curiosity rover is right now. Most of us would say, oh, that's just four or five miles outside of Canal. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's Mars. Is that scenery that deserves to be protected? Yeah. I would argue it does. I mean, I know how crackpot this sounds, but I'm here lecturing you and saying that, you know, in the next hundred years, the scope of the National Park Service probably needs to be adjusted for the fact that human beings are getting out there in some places. Uh, that is the, um, the edge of Victoria Crater, as uh, imaged by one of the uh, Mars roving vehicles. I thought it was either um, uh, spirit or opportunity. It wasn't curiosity. The vehicles themselves are historically significant objects. That's curiosity. That's a selfie that it took. But one day it will be parked and dead and just sitting there as an historical artifact. I think it should have a fence built around it and there should be a park ranger in a helmet with the smoky bear hat on top of it. And I, I, you know, I say to myself, I think it's cool that in this artist's concept, we've got people on Mars and I'm glad to see the American flag, you know, yay us. But I also can't help but wonder if what we should be asking about is should any of these people, figuratively speaking, have the smoky bear hat? Should they be there mindful of their mission to protect and interpret and share these historically significant objects, these culturally valuable landscapes to protect them. Ray Bradbury wrote a story called The Martian Chronicles in which a kind of a slimy guy went to Mars and he was really excited because he was going to get rich on Mars by opening the, the Sam's first hot dog stand. <laughs> and it did not end well for him. If you, if you want to read some fun science fiction, read Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. But so you have sort of competing visions. One, we say to ourselves, we owe it to our great-great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren. We owe it to them to do the responsible thing and say, that has to be more important than the fact that somebody's got an idea for a way to make a quick buck for that. So that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, I know why. I, I have five more minutes. I want to turn on the light. And um, I want to share with you a campground activity that's kind of fun. So you're wandering around the campground. Capital B for and so you're, you know, and it's a summer night sky, and you're saying, you see that thing, a little fuzzball that you can barely make out with your naked eye? That's the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. Let me tell you a story about how far away that is. So you say, I'm using a paper plate, because Lord knows they're everywhere in a camera. And I've got on here an image of our galaxy. This is an artist's concept of, to the best of our knowledge, what home is Milky Way. And we are on the inside edge of a spiral arm about half, maybe a little bit more, the distance from the center. And oh, by the way, that bright center is what you see when you look above the spout of the teapot. That's downtown Milky Way. And this little red pin that I have pushed in here, the diameter of that pin is just about a millimeter. And the diameter of that pin at this scale represents the volume of space within which every single star you can see naked eye is. Every star visible to the naked eye is inside that little red dot. And now, having said all that, which means that as you look up at Andromeda, you realize that you are seeing way beyond this thing. We know that Andromeda, here's another paper plate, is a bit bigger than the Milky Way. Exactly how much bigger is a little subject to debate. 
Some people say twice as large, others say about 50% as large. It certainly has more mass, but its diameter, we will say this is approximately 100,000 light years, and this is about um, 2.5 million light years. 100,000 light years, 2.5 million light years distant, maybe a diameter of 200,000 light years. So now, how far away are these? Well, here's a cool thing. If this is 100,000 light years, then this is 25 times this diameter away. And so with a little bit of help, you just simply figure out that, okay, so if that's a 9-inch pie plate, do the number crunching and say, then that would mean that Andromeda is about 18 or 19 feet away. And that is the correct scale distance between the galaxies. And so now, of course, this is a journey that takes photon of light 2.5 million years to reach. If I created a scale model photon and said it's on its way, you would have to stay here and Dave's arm would grow very tired. Oh, I'm tough. <laughs> he is tough. But anyway, there is a way for you with paper plates to show the distances to galaxies and then say, well, Andromeda is only two and a half million light years away. Then you aim your telescope at something like the Whirlpool, and it's like, what, 35 million light years away thereabouts? And then you can start talking about distances. And then having done the exercise with astronomical units in inches and light years and miles, you can, uh, you can do that. Any questions? Light is slow. <laughs> it is remarkably slow. We think of light as being like this wicked fast, seven times around the world in one second type thing get to the moon in a little over one second, but on an intergalactic scale, shoot, even within the solar system, it is painfully slow. So it's just a matter of perspective. Well, yeah, I'm thinking with the sun, mm -hmm. we, we just think it's instantaneous. Eight minutes, a little over eight minutes, about eight and a third minutes. That kind of puts it in perspective, Well, considering that that's one AU. when you look at what, yeah. and that's one AU, and, and yet, <laughs> Like just about the hardest thing we can do on Earth is send a rocket inward. It's very difficult. And if you want to go one AU out, say get out to say Mars or the asteroid belt, that is a journey of at a minimum many, many months with the fastest rockets we now have. How long has Voyager 1 and 2, which are just now breaking into truly interstellar space, have been in flight for 40 years? Yeah. And, um, and they're like the fastest things humans have ever sent into space. All right, other questions? I'm just wondering what your feelings are about the feasibility of getting people to Mars. I mean, my it's own... really hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm always, in, I'm, I, am, I am philosophically predisposed to favor exploration, but I also know that the safest, infinitely less expensive, most productive thing in terms of getting a lot of bang for the buck, science, get the science back, is we can send a hundred robots out into space <coughs> armed with cameras and God knows what yeah. that are going to keep graduate students busy for a century yeah. for what it will cost to, with extreme danger, send a human being somewhere. Yeah. And having said that, there's a great line in uh, the movie The Right Stuff where astronauts are being challenged about um, it's just too damn expensive and dangerous and complicated to put human beings in this stupid tin can and put you in the space. Why don't we just send instruments? And the answer was, no Buck Rogers, no bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Congress loves to support the adventure, the heroism, the danger, the glory of people. It's, it's in our blood. We're hardwired to have send people to those places. It's what we do. And so the, 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 the tug of war is going to be forever over funding. You can get the public's endorsement of human spaceflight at budgets that would make astronomers weep. 
when you cannot get a fraction of that funding to send robots and computers and remote controlled cameras. And so, and then, oh, by the way, what are we really doing to improve our condition? And then, of course, budget priorities. It's like, well, yeah, you know what? Four or five hundred billion dollars will get me people on Mars. Do I have four or five hundred billion dollars burning a hole in my pocket right now? So, what's the relative value to us? And that is a subject that we can chew on and have glorious arguments over. And people can express their priorities and put their values out on the table. And you can basically, in a, what we hope will be democratic process, put it to the vote. Say, you want to go to the Mars? Here's the check. And say, like, I'm willing to do that. Because again, you know, like what it would cost each and every one of us to finance that is kind of manageable. You go, yeah, you know what, I have wasted way more money on that. And, you know, like the last family vacation I took, and it's, oh, by the way, this is a 20-year project. So Disneyland. That, yeah, I mean, for, for what a family spends to go to Disneyland, they have funded eight or ten people's contribution to a Mars mission. So you have your choice, again, budgets, priorities, values, timelines, and what matters to people and, and let people argue about it. The best thing in the world we can be doing is having chewy, angry, <laughs> loud arguments right. about these things because the only way you learn anything new is to argue. Is to argue about it. Well, there's debate. Debate is yeah, we love debate. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, Good. Uh, I really thank you. This is very, very kind of you and really yeah. And, uh, I think you also um, mentioned that um, some of us are probably going to go to Village Inn right afterwards and have a little dinner if anyone would like to go. And one other thing is, um, I would like, if anybody here is on my mailing list, especially you, <laughs> if I could get you to give me my your email, I'll put you on my list. Does that work all right? I'll just start. Uh,